Hi, this is Mrs. Marita. Welcome to AP's Dads, Lesson 4.3a. Two learning targets for today, 4.31 and 2. Explain the concept of sampling variability when making inference about a population and how sample size affects the sampling variability. And explain the meaning of statistically significant in the context of an experiment. And use simulation to determine if the results of the experiment are statistically significant. Section 4.3 focuses on using studies wisely. Let's consider two examples. The U.S. Census Bureau carries out a monthly current population survey of about 60,000 households. Their goal is to use the data from these randomly selected households to estimate the percent of unemployed individuals in the population. A second example is where scientists perform an experiment that randomly assigns 21 volunteer subjects to one of two treatments, sleep deprivation for one night or unrestricted sleep. The examiners hope to show that sleep deprivation causes a decrease in performance two days later. What we want to know is what type of inference can be made from each of these particular studies. The answer depends on the design of the study. A common mistake in AP stats is to confuse inference for a population with inference about cause and effect. We're going to get more into this connection between inference and the design of the study in tomorrow's lesson. But for starters, if you randomly select members from a population, your sample results will be able to infer things about that population. But inference from convenience samples or voluntary response samples would be misleading. These type of sampling methods are biased, and in these cases, we are almost certain that the samples we take do not fairly represent the population we're trying to study. But even when making inference from a random sample, it would be surprising if our estimate was exactly equal to the truth of the population. This is because different samples will yield different results. Now our hope is that our sample is close to the population truth, that's why we're taking it. And so we're going to talk about sampling variability today. And what we're going to see is that if you take a larger sample, your estimates will be closer to the truth. So let's consider a quick example. Suppose we sampled from a large population of plastic beads. You know, the little ones maybe you made bracelets and stuff with their arts and crafts when you were a little kid. So if you think about this large population of beads, where we know that the true proportion of red beads is 30%. So you've got this big bag of beads, 30% is red, and 70% is something else. We're going to consider two different samples. First, sample one. So in our class, suppose all 40 of us in the class, take a sample of size 20. So each of us randomly select 20 beads. Then we look what proportion of our beads are red. And then we put them back, we mix the bag, and the next student comes in. They take out 20 beads, they count, find the proportion of red beads, put them back. That's our sample one. A second sample we could have done, instead of taking 20 beads, we repeat the same process, but now we take samples of size 100. Oh my gosh, this would take forever. But let's suppose we did this. We have two dot plots to the right. There's 40 dots on each dot plot, and each dot represents one student sample. And the placement of the dot corresponds with the percent of red beads in the student sample. We can see that both of our dot plots are centered around 30, the true percent of red beads. But if we look at our second dot plot on the bottom of sample size 100, there's much less variability. And so with our larger sample size, we get a decrease in the variability of our distribution. 4.3 example one, how much do NFL players weigh? In a random sample of 50 NFL players, the average weight is 244.4 pounds. Let's use this example to answer a couple questions about variability in sampling. Part A. Do you think that 244.4 pounds is the true average weight of all NFL players? Explain your answer. We should say no. This is because different samples of 50 NFL players would produce different average weights. If we wanted to know the true average weight of all NFL players, we would need to take a census. Part B. Which would be more likely to give an estimate close to the true average weight of all NFL players? A random sample of 50 players or a random sample of 100 players? Now there's a lot of players in the NFL, so a census would be a lot of work. So we would say a random sample of 100 players would be more likely to give an estimate close to the true average weight of all NFL players. This is because larger samples tend to be closer to the truth. If you sample a larger amount from your population, your sample is going to be more representative of that population you are sampling from. 
Now let's move on to our second learning target, focusing on statistical significance. Statistical significance is what we're going to spend our whole second semester on. When we do have a well-designed experiment, this allows us to make inferences about cause and effect. But we should only conclude that the changes in the explanatory variable cause the changes in the response variable if we see statistically significant results. When we observe results that are too unusual to be explained by just chance alone, that's when we say that our results are statistically significant. 4.3 example 2. Is talking on a cell phone while driving more distracting than talking to a passenger? The University of Utah designed an experiment with 48 undergraduate students to study this topic. The researchers in this study randomly assigned half of the subjects to drive in a simulator while talking on a cell phone, and the other half to drive in a simulator while talking to a passenger. One response variable was whether or not the driver stopped at a rest area that was specified by researchers before the simulation started. The table below shows our results. Part A. Calculate the difference passenger minus cell phone in the proportion of students who stopped at the rest area in the two groups. To find the difference in proportions, we're going to look at some conditional distributions from the table above. First, we want to look at our conditional distribution given that the subject was talking to a passenger. So the proportion of students in this group who stopped at the rest stop was 21 over 24. And then the group who were talking on the cell phone, this was 12 over 24. So from our study, we find 87.5% of students who were talking to a passenger still stopped at the rest stop, where only half of the students who were talking on a cell phone stopped at the rest stop. This difference is 37.5% or 0.375. Now let's look at a simulation that the researchers did. 100 trials of a simulation were performed to see what difference in proportions would occur due to only chance variation in random assignment. So this is with the assumption that the type of distraction has no effect, whether the subject stopped or didn't stop at the rest area. That is, in our study, out of the 48 students, 33 were stoppers. They stopped at the rest stop. And 15 were non-stoppers. Part B wants us to consider these three dots at the end, the po at point 0.29. Explain what these dots mean in context. So if we assume that there's no difference in the two treatments, whether you're talking to a passenger or talking on a cell phone, only three out of the 100 simulated trials would give us a difference in proportions of those who stopped, that was 0.29. Now, if you're hanging in there with me with this difference of proportion thing, way to go. It does kind of mess with your brain a little bit. So let's connect this to part A before we actually write up part B. So when we did an example in part A, we looked at a difference in proportions, passenger minus cell phone, and we got a difference of proportions of 0.375. But this was just from one sample of 48 students. What the simulation is trying to do is say, well, what if we got another group of 48 and another group of 48? What if we got 100 groups of 48 students? Each dot on our dot plot is representing a similar difference between a new group of 48 simulated students. Now, our 0.375 that we got, if you notice, that doesn't even fit on the dot plot. We didn't even get a dot that large. Our largest dots in the simulation were 0.29. That's why we're looking at those. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means, why our 0.375 seems so large compared to our simulated results in part C. But for now, we just want to get our head around what the simulation is. The simulation is giving us an opportunity to regenerate more and more samples and see, well, with these requirements, with these parameters, assuming 33 students would stop, 15 would not in any group of 48 students, what do we think would happen? And so the dot plot represents 100 situations of what would happen. So again, our 0.29s, those three that we circled at the top, those are just saying we would get a difference of 0.29 instead of what we saw in our one example in part A, 0.375. So to wrap up part B, there were three dots at 0.29. Explain what these dots mean in context. We would say, when we assumed that the type of distraction doesn't matter, there were three simulated trials, those three dots, where the difference in the proportion of those who stopped when we did our passenger minus cell phone proportions was 0.29.
part C. Use the results of the simulation, so that was that dot plot up above, to determine if the difference in proportions from part A, that's our 0.375, is statistically significant. Explain your reasoning. So we'll say, because a difference in proportions of 0.375 or greater never occurred in our simulation, the difference is statistically significant. And then to explain our reasoning, we'll say, it is very unlikely to get a difference in proportions this big simply due to chance variation in random assignment. So the second part that is very unlikely, there's two things to think about here. Well, first, we only did 100 simulated trials. 100 simulated trials may seem like a lot, but that's not every possible trial. And so maybe we think, well, maybe if we did 1,000 simulated trials, one of our trials might give us 0.375 as our difference in proportions. So we're not going to say it is impossible. We're just going to say it's very unlikely and extremely unlikely based on our simulation because it didn't even happen once. The second part of this loaded explanation at the end is that idea that simply due to chance variation and random assignment, what in the world does that mean? So our simulation was designed with the assumption that talking to a passenger or talking on the phone had no effect. And we just randomly assigned these individuals to see if they stopped or didn't stop at the rest stop. But seeing that our simulated results did not include anyone that had the same proportion that we found in part A, what we are getting to conclude is that, well, maybe they do have an effect. Maybe speaking on the phone versus speaking to a passenger does have a different effect on whether or not you stop at a rest stop. So to wrap up this example, just a reminder, our one sample, it was way out here. And that didn't occur by chance even once in our simulated results. When we were looking at our three dots way out here, what we found was, well, this 0.29 only occurred 3% of the time, right? Three out of 100. And so that was very rare. What we saw occurred 0% of the time in our simulation. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, what would we consider rare? So if we're saying, well, 0%, that never occurred, that would be statistically significant. What if we did get a sample of 0.29? 3% of the time it occurs, is that rare enough for us to consider statistically significant? Or what if instead of 0.375, we saw 0.21? So that would be this group. Well, this group, there's 12 and 3, so this is a 15%, 15 out of the 100 is 15% rare. Hopefully we're starting to think, no, 3%, probably, 0%, definitely, 15%, mm, maybe not. So this cutoff, this idea of what we consider statistically significant or what percent we would consider unlikely to occur due to just chance variation, that's how you get paid the big bucks as a statistician. But we're going to learn more tools and some future rules to determine what we will have as a cutoff as yes, that will say statistically significant or no, that's likely to occur just by chance.